Hi, and welcome to lecture one of my introductory course on Bitcoins. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing some of the core foundational introductory information that's required to really deeply understand the Bitcoin. I make the assumption throughout this entire course that number one, you have no technical skills, meaning you're not a computer programmer or an IT expert. And number two, you have just heard about the Bitcoin. Maybe it was in the Wall Street Journal or maybe it was in um, New York Times or perhaps some sort of thing on CNBC where people were talking about this and you said a bit what? Uh, and that's exactly what we're looking for, is a person who knows nothing about the Bitcoin. But by the end of this course, you'll actually know a great deal about the Bitcoin. In fact, so much, you'll probably be a local expert. So let's get started. To understand a bit about the Bitcoin, the first thing that we really need to discuss is money. Money is not generally something people think about. It's, uh, it's one of those things in life that just tends to work. When you pull out a $20 bill from your wallet, when you pull out those 10 euros and buy something with it, you kind of take that for granted. And only if you're in economics or finance do you really stop and take a step back and say, well, wait a minute here, what exactly is this? And why do I need this? And oh, how does this work? And it's actually a very deep and very complex topic. And we'll be discussing just enough to be able to give you a keen sense of why money is necessary and why the Bitcoin is special. After we discuss money, uh, we're going to go ahead and transition very quickly into the Bitcoin. And this is kind of a rough view of it. And we're going to drill down much deeper in the subsequent lectures on specific topics of the Bitcoin. But at the end of this lecture, you'll have a pretty good idea of what the Bitcoin is. Then we're going to discuss why are Bitcoins special. Bitcoins are a very unique type of currency. In fact, the very first peer-to-peer -peer distributed currency ever conceived that seem to work and they're incredibly secure and so we're going to discuss that and um, kind of give you a really strong understanding of what makes them unique then of course it's necessary to discuss who controls the bitcoin the reason being is that unlike normal money the control of the bitcoin works very very differently and it's important that you understand uh, the controlling forces within the bitcoin how it can go wrong where it can go right uh, so you can avoid some of the misinformation that tends to be flowing around just due to ignorance. Of course, it's natural to ask with any currency or any commodity, why is it worth something? Why is gold worth something? Why is silver worth something? And so we'll ask the exact same question with the Bitcoin. And finally, we'll go ahead and introduce a couple of wonderful links that are great introductions to get you started inside the Bitcoin world. First, it's going to connect you to a lot of uh, websites that specialize in discussing the Bitcoin. And there's some intro videos that are probably even better than mine, to be honest, uh, that I would highly recommend just to get you started with the Bitcoin. OK, so let's start with money. What is money? When I took economics years ago, money was explained to me by an elucidating story. So the very first thing human beings started doing when we started to communicate with each other was barter. Barter is when I have something you want and you have something I want, we come together and we agree to exchange it. For example, I could be a neurosurgeon and you could be a baker. So maybe you have brain cancer and I go to you and say, if you give me bread for the rest of your life, I'll go ahead and operate on you and save your life. And as a baker, you'd be like, okay, that's kind of a fair deal. There's not many neurosurgeons floating around and you know, I have lots of surplus bread. So that seems like a legitimate deal. Well, here's the problem. The vast majority of bakers do not have brain cancer. So even though I, as a neurosurgeon, have a skill that is incredibly valuable, it's very rare. It takes decades to refine and develop. I'm probably going to starve to death because I have no utility to society outside of this very small subset. And if I had to barter with people to survive, I, unless I live in a massive community and I got really lucky about the people who develop brain cancer or brain trauma, I probably would not make it. And so in a barter-based society, people with very specialized skills don't tend to do very well. And this is a problem because the key to advancing, the key to growing quickly is specialization. Imagine if everybody in addition to being an engineer or a mathematician or a rocket scientist also had to be a farmer. 
this would cause problems. So we said, how about we go ahead and develop something that lets the neurosurgeon be a neurosurgeon, but also prevents him from starving to death. And that's kind of money. Money is usually defined in terms of three functions. The first is a means of exchange. The second is a store of value, and the third is a unit of account. So when we think about money, we say first, we don't want to build a society where every time you want something, you have to find something that that person who has it wants. Instead, let's create a standard unit, a dollar, a pound, a euro, where the neurosurgeon can acquire these by doing his job and then spend them any way he or she sees fit. And so when he goes to the baker, the baker will agree to exchange bread for this standard unit of exchange. Another problem is bread is a finite commodity. It tends to decay over time. It tends to rot. Or if you will, maybe we can talk about a person who raises chickens. Chickens tend to die. So it's really difficult if your currency or your money was chickens or bread to store value because your store is very large, it's very hard to move around, it's difficult to go ahead and find people who'd want that many chickens at a particular period of time. So money is an intermediary that removes commodities completely and barter completely and it allows us to store arbitrary amounts of value. So the neurosurgeon, for example, because he has highly specialized skills, is probably going to be paid a lot of money. And the neurosurgeon can amass large sums of money to do things like buy homes or buy cars or whatever he or she desires. The last thing is standardization of account, a unit of account. How difficult would it be, using our neurosurgeon and baker dilemma problem, for the baker to properly price or the neurosurgeon to properly price their skills in relation to each other? So think about a baker who doesn't have brain cancer, and the neurosurgeon says, well, I'll make you a deal. If you ever do develop it, I'll go ahead and give you my operation for free. Okay, that's a one-time thing. So I guess the baker's bread is worth that. But what happens when the mechanic comes to the baker? Is he going to get lifetime bread or bread for a year or bread for six months? And how does the baker relate with the grain grower? So we said, hey, let's create this thing called money. Let's put a number on the money, and then people can kind of make a decision through a market process of either being told it's too high or you know, over, uh, overselling so they know it's too low, of kind of basically deciding what the value of things are through a free market system. And so a unit of account is very convenient. For example, if you go into King Supers or into Safeway, you see a loaf of bread is a dollar or some donuts are $2.50, for example. Okay, you understand what that means. You understand what money means within your local economy, and then you can kind of get an idea of what's expensive and what's cheap. For example, you know how to price a Lamborghini versus a Ford Fusion. Okay, there are a couple of other things we tend to think about in terms of money. We also tend to care about divisibility. So when I have a dollar, it would be nice if I could break that dollar into smaller parts. For example, I probably wouldn't want to pay for a gumball machine a dollar for a gumball. So what do we do? We pay a quarter or a dime, for example. So we're able to break the dollar into smaller parts. Or if I have a $100 bill, there are ways of purchasing even a small item, like a loaf of bread, for example, and then breaking that into smaller pieces so that I can use those smaller pieces at a later date and the merchant who receives that bill also can do the same. So divisibility is a property of money that's necessary. Durability is another property of money that's necessary. So in paper-based currencies, the durability is usually measured in terms of years. With uh, metal-based currencies like coinage, the durability can be decades, if not centuries. In fact, some currencies like Roman coins, Greek coins, uh, have been around for thousands of years, which tell you that durability is something that uh, is a uh, prerequisite for good money. Fungibility is another term that you probably haven't heard. Um, it's a it's an odd term. It comes from the commodity markets. Fungibility means we don't care about one versus the other. So if I pull out a dollar bill and you pull out a dollar bill and we put them on the table and we look at them, they're identical except for the serial number. And that doesn't matter in terms of value, its accounting unit, or its exchange process. So the fungibility is basically saying you don't care about one dollar versus another dollar. You can think of it as like bushels of wheat. 
one bushel of wheat, as long as it's the same size, ought to be treated the same as another bushel of wheat. They're fundamentally fungible, that's the term. And then finally, verifiability. It's really important that we understand that the money that we receive is indeed legitimate money. And everybody agrees that that is the money that the society is going to be using. I can't just write one dollar on a piece of paper and hand it to you. It has to be verifiable as a true dollar. Okay, so that's kind of money in a nutshell. It's something that resolves a dilemma of specialization and allows us to buy things that we want without having to barter for every single thing. We store value, we understand what prices are, and we have these interesting properties like the visibility and verifiability attached. So a very natural question is, why is money worth anything? And in a more abstract sense, why is anything worth anything? Well, it's worth something because a group of people agree to exchange it in turn for goods and services. You can take a hundred dollars and go and buy something with that. You can get food, you can get a hotel room, you can rent a car, you can, uh, you can go ahead and you know, pay a toll to go to a national park and see a beautiful vista. You can buy a cheap camera. There are things you can do with that money because society, whatever society you happen to live in and whatever money you happen to be spending has agreed to accept that money to exchange goods and services. We also acknowledge that some authority has to be in charge of validating and maintaining that money. We can't just go ahead and make up our own money, walk around, and then you know, independently negotiate with people to go ahead and start accepting this money, because then we're back to bartering. We're, we've just abstracted it to something that we do ourselves. Instead, what we do is we say, okay, Federal Reserve System, or Central Bank of Europe, or Central Bank of China, you are in charge of the currency of our people, and you validate it and you maintain it, and you take care of it, and then you deal with other proxies to print it and to distribute it and so forth, and we will agree to exchange it for services and money. But we entrust a small group of people, some sort of authority, who is special to validate and maintain our currency. And currencies tend to also be backed by something such as an attachment to the respect of the entity that backs it. So we trust the Federal Reserve System for the most part. We say this is an entity that uh, is good and it makes great decisions. Although we'll get to that a little bit later that maybe why we shouldn't. Or um, some sort of finite resource. Some currencies are backed by resources like gold or silver. Uh, they can be backed by services guaranteed by a government or a, an issuing agency, for example. So. In a nutshell, monies are worth something because we agree to exchange goods and services for them. Some sort of authority agrees to validate and maintain it, and currencies are usually backed in some way or another by uh, either respect, that's called a fiat currency, or a resource like gold. So what's the problem? Why don't we just always use money? Why do we need to invent new kinds of monies? Why is the dollar not sufficient? Well, here's one of the biggest issues. A small group of people decide how to regulate and manage the currency. And the reason why this is a problem is this picture. So this is the $100 trillion bill. I remember reading about a rancher in Zimbabwe who decided to retire in 2001. And he'd worked very hard. He worked for 30 years. And he was so incredibly excited that he could sell his land and all of his cattle. He had thousands upon thousands of cattle and this huge, huge ranch, and he sold it. And he made millions of Zimbabwean dollars. And at the time, the exchange rate was pretty comparable with the United States, so it wasn't too bad. So he, he was gonna live very, very well, he basically equivalent to what, how a millionaire in the United States would live. And then remember, this is millions of Zimbabwean dollars that he sold his ranch for. So he had a lot of faith that that money was gonna be worth something. And then here's this bill printed in 2008 for $100 trillion. To refresh your memory on trillion, a trillion is a thousand billion, a million million. Okay, so basically, and this bill allowed you to basically purchase a loaf of bread. So for that ranch, he sold the thousands of cattle, the thousands of acres, all the land, and that 30 years of hard work translated because of the collapse of the Zimbabwean dollar to less than a loaf of bread. 
it got so bad in Zimbabwe that actually the workers would want to be paid during uh, the mornings so that they could give the money to their wives and have them buy groceries during the mornings because the currency would be worth about half as much at night and they would be able to buy less. It's a pretty terrible thing. Another issue is that online exchange tends to lack any notion of privacy. If you need some sort of central authority to validate and maintain the currency, you have to share what you buy with that central authority in some way, form, or fashion for them to verify that you indeed have that money and you're not double spending it. It's legitimately yours. And that introduces some privacy concerns. You also have to trust one nation at a time. And that's very problematic because just like the rancher who trusted Zimbabwe, he got burned terribly. And if you're an American, you have to trust the U.S. government that the dollar is strong and secure. If you're a Chinese person, you have to trust that the yuan is secure. You have to trust that the euro is secure if you live in the European Union. And there are some doubts now in the European Union if that's the case. So there's a lot of faith and trust that you have to place in people that you've probably never met who are making decisions that sometimes you can't, aren't even privy to the reasons why. So there's a lot of faith there. In addition, you have to have faith in more than just the original validator, but also entities like banks and PayPal. Here's why. If you're online and you're spending money, uh, your money has to be sitting in some sort of account, like Chase or Wells Fargo. It has to be sitting in some sort of account, like PayPal. If PayPal goes out of business, if Chase goes out of business, unless your government has made a commitment to go ahead and reimburse you, and they do this generally through the FDIC in America, uh, you lose everything. Or let's say the government itself has instability and lots of banks go out of business. It may not even have enough money on hand to be able to compensate you. So you have to have a lot of faith. You have to have faith in the entities that uh, do business with the government, banks and PayPal, for example. Then you have to trust the nation that you have the money in, and then you have to surrender your privacy. And all of this is somehow propped up and held up by a very small group of people whom you've never met, probably never will meet, uh, and a lot of their decisions are made in secret. So there's some problems with regular money. So how do we solve these problems? We understand that we need money. We understand why money is important. We understand why money can have value, but then we also acknowledge that money has these foundational flaws. It has these privacy flaws. It has a lot of faith attached to it. You're relying on people you've never met and you know nothing about to make decisions in your best interest. And some of these people belong to other governments. Some of these people probably don't have your best interest at heart. So uh, a gentleman named Satoshi Nakamoto, and it's actually a pen name, we don't know who he really is, sat down and thought very, very deeply for a long time. And he's thought about, how do I build a new type of money that has very few of the problems of old money and allows us to spend money in an anonymous way, as anonymous as cash, without any government manipulating it, without any government touching it, uh, and, and how do we do this in a way that no one entity or person can control it? And he wrote this paper back in 2009, and he published it anonymously, which is really an amazing thing, an anonymous currency created by an anonymous person under a Japanese um, pseudonym. And he developed the Bitcoin. So basically what the Bitcoin does is it takes that central authority, and in the case of the U.S. dollar, that would be the Federal Reserve System, and it completely removes it. And instead says, we're going to construct a peer-to-peer -peer system, and we're going to replace that middleman with an open-sourced set of algorithms that everybody knows, that everybody can understand if they have the technical expertise, and they're absolute in their focus. So no one entity or party can manipulate them. And if everybody who uses the currency agrees to these sets of algorithms, they become basically as good as the Federal Reserve System. In our Bitcoin mining lecture, we're going to discuss the um, algorithms in a little bit more depth and a little bit more detail. But suffice to say that they're 
uh, at this point, incredibly well vetted. Since this came out in 2009, we've had four years to look at them, to have the whole world tear them apart and try to see flaws or issues. And for the most part, there is a consensus that these algorithms are incredibly well designed and stable. And we'll discuss them in a bit. The Bitcoin system, if you want to understand it, is kind of like a collection of clients analogous to torrent clients. So if you know what a torrent is, think of um, BitTorrent, think of file sharing. Like people talk about downloading videos online or downloading music online, and you take pieces of it and distribute it to many people. So basically what the Bitcoin is like is it's this distributed network where at any time that master file, which is the record of every transaction ever made and who owns what inside the system, is owned by every single client. So unlike the US dollar, where I only know about how many dollars I have and maybe if I'm good at looking online, I can kind of look at how many dollars are in circulation, the Bitcoin keeps a record of every transaction ever made. So where the money went into which accounts. Of course, the first question you'll ask is say, well, wait a minute, isn't this supposed to be anonymous? Isn't this supposed to be something that, that, that no, nobody knows my identity? Absolutely. Accounts are anonymous. What the accounts are, they, they use this thing called a public key, which is a cryptographic term, which I won't define right now. But it suffices to say the same way that Satoshi Nakamoto was able to publish a paper but keep his identity anonymous, you're able to use your account to receive bitcoins and send bitcoins, but it's not attached to personally identifiable information. So nobody knows who you are, but you're able to pay for things using that account. It's, pretty, it's really an amazing concept if you think about it. So here we have a currency which removed the middleman, so no government is in charge of this, no corporation or, or group of people are in charge of this. We have a set of rules that everybody who uses this currency has agreed to follow, and they can't not follow it. It's, it's enforced. And then we have taken something similar to how torrents work, and we've gone ahead and taken all the money in the entire ecosystem, all the transactions in the ecosystem, and everybody knows about them. And as a result of that knowledge, it's nearly impossible to defraud the system. It's pretty amazing. And while doing all of this, we've, able, we've been able to build something that allows you to be anonymous. When someone wishes to spend a Bitcoin, all you have to do is use a secret key that's associated with that public key that's your address and send it to someone else's account. You click a button. It's very similar to sending an email. We have a, we're going to have an entire lecture on receiving Bitcoins and spending Bitcoins to help you uh, better understand this because this is going to require a little bit of time. But suffice it to say, sending a Bitcoin to somebody is as simple as sending an email. So it's completely anonymous for the most part. It is entirely transparent. All the rules are absolute. They're set in stone, and there's no way to cheat them uh, without breaking the entire system. And then everybody would know the system is broken, uh, and no one entity can control it. So that is the Bitcoin in kind of a, a really high-level nutshell. And throughout this entire course, we're going to be tearing that apart and analyzing pieces of it. And so hopefully you'll kind of gain a, a better understanding of the entire Bitcoin. So why is the Bitcoin special besides the things that I've mentioned? Well, first, one of the things that Satoshi decided to do, unlike conventional currencies, which suffer from inflation, meaning they become less valuable over time, Satoshi decided to fix the maximum amount of Bitcoins possible. What he did is he said, the maximum circulation is going to be 21 million coins. So what happens is, when we first created the currency back in 2009, we created lots of coins, and there's a, it's called Bitcoin mining. That's how coins are constructed. In lecture four, we're going to talk about that. But over time, we create less and less coins. So think of this like a gold mine. When we first start mining gold, there's lots of gold in the ground. It's the first time we've done it, so you can find it everywhere. Or like oil. When we first started drilling oil in spindle top and other areas, it, you know, it was 20 feet down. It spurred out of the ground. But now we're having to get oil from Athabasca and, and like use complex stuff to convert 
proto oil into real oil and uh, and go offshore to the Arctic in these hellish wastelands just to get the same amount of oil. So it's becoming more difficult to get oil. And it's the exact same way with the Bitcoin. The Bitcoin behaves like a commodity with a maximum limit on how much can exist enforced by those open source algorithms. No one party can enforce that. It's enforced globally. So it's an intrinsically deflationary currency. It actually becomes more valuable over time, as opposed to things like the dollar or the euro, which become less valuable over time. Therefore, there's an incentive to save. Second, every transaction is verified by the entire Bitcoin network. So imagine if every time someone goes to spend a dollar at King Supers or at 7-Eleven or at Walmart, a Secret Service agent pops up with all the other Secret Service agents and looks at that dollar and then tells the cashier, yeah, the dollar's good. That's basically how secure the Bitcoin is in terms of counterfeiting. If you attempt to spend a Bitcoin twice, the network will find out about it or the entire network will shut down. It's, it's, a, it's actually kind of an amazing piece of technology to be able to do that. It's, um, it solved a very old distributed computing problem involving distributed databases and timestamps. And uh, Satoshi used this thing called uh, Hashcash and a proof of work to do so. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal. And we'll discuss this in much more detail when I discuss Bitcoin mining and how Bitcoin mining works. But for the time being, just understand that counterfeiting Bitcoins is mathematically almost impossible. And while all transactions are known, like cash, there is no identity explicitly attached to the transaction, which makes the Bitcoin pseudo-anonymous. As I mentioned before, Although we know where the, uh, what accounts receive Bitcoins and those transactions to accounts, that we know the entire history, you, if you can conceal, you separate your identity from uh, that address, which is very easy to do using lots of different pieces of technology, no one can ever know that you're the person who owns those Bitcoins. And just like if you, you know, put a mask over your face when you go to Walmart and you buy something, even though they have you on camera, they don't know it's you. So it's as anonymous as you're probably going to get online uh, for purchasing things. Due to their decentralized nature, another thing that makes Bitcoins very special is no one government can effectively regulate or control the Bitcoin. It would require the consent of the entire Internet. So let's say China says the Bitcoin is a threat to our regime and therefore we're going to ban people from using the Bitcoin and we're going to block it. Well, the Chinese government can try to do that. They can legislate it, but it would be like going to Mexico and saying drug trafficking is illegal or to Colombia and say it's illegal to grow cocaine. It, you can say that. It's not going to change anything. Um, you can't legislate the Bitcoin out of existence. You can't regulate the Bitcoin out of existence. It's completely decentralized, and it would require every actor on the Internet to reach a consensus that they will follow that. And for the most part, that is physically impossible to do. It, the Bitcoin is really smashing two amazing concepts together. It's taking digital currencies and their divisibility. Because digital currencies are just numbers sitting in a computer, you can break them into any units you so desire, as small as you want to make them. But it's taking that and combining it with something like the scarcity of gold. As I mentioned, you can only ever make 21 million Bitcoins. That's the maximum amount. We'll reach that in 2140. And so over time, they become much more valuable, but what we can do is simply just break them into smaller and smaller into smaller units. So right now, the price of a Bitcoin is hovering around $100, and a couple of years back, it was hovering around $4. A couple of years back, it was hovering around $0.05 cents a Bitcoin. So the Bitcoin consistently has become more valuable, but I'm still able to conduct commerce because a year ago, when I wanted to buy something with a Bitcoin, if it was $4, I would use one Bitcoin. Today, I would use uh, 25 divided by four. So it kind of gives you, it kind of gives you an idea of, of how we can deal with this kind of currency. You can just break it into smaller and smaller units, so it's okay for it to deflate in value. 
and it gives you an incentive to actually save as opposed to every other currency in the world which is basically get into debt as quickly as possible spend as much money as quickly as possible because your money is worth more today than it will be tomorrow if you've ever sold anything on ebay and you've used PayPal, you can understand the incredible frustration of a chargeback. So let's say that you sell collective plates, collectible plates, and they're of John Wayne. And you, you've been doing this for years, and you really love John Wayne, you have all these wonderful plates. And so somebody, John Wayne Plate Lover 17, buys your plate, and you pack it up real nice, and you send it to John Wayne Plate Lover 17, and you get a confirmation email saying, yes, that person received the plate and everything seems fine. You were paid on PayPal. And then suddenly a month later, get an email saying that the buyer requested a refund because he never received the plate. Now you know you sent it. You have a delivering confirmation. Let's say for the sake of the argument, you even have a signature. So you contact PayPal and say, well, wait a minute here. I sent that plate and you show them all the evidence. And then PayPal says, eh, we're kind of a consumer friendly business. So we're just gonna refund the money. So now here's what happened. You sent your product to a person and that person defrauded you and there's nothing you can do about that. So some chargebacks are legitimate, a lot aren't, and it's an incredible frustration for merchants. Some credit card chargebacks can occur three months after purchase. The Bitcoin, once you've given someone a money, it's in their wallet. You can't reverse it. And you can contact them if you know who they are and send them an email saying, Blah, go ahead and please give me a... Uh, Go ahead and please give me a, uh, you know, my money back. And if they're a nice person, they can say, oh, okay, I'll give you your money back. But for the most part, it's up to them. So it's a kind of a beautiful thing if you're a merchant uh, that you don't have to deal with chargebacks. But also it's a double-edged sword if you're a consumer um, that buyer beware. If you spend money, sometimes your money may not come back. So you have to be a little bit more careful than normal currencies. Accounts can never be frozen by a government. That's really a cool thing. A friend of mine was investigated by the Securities Exchange Commission, and eventually he won the lawsuit. But in the meantime, uh, his accounts were frozen. And for about a year and a half, even though he was a millionaire, he had to live off of about $5,000 for that 16 months or 17 months. And he didn't have enough money because his accounts were frozen to hire a competent counsel. And luckily his brother, who was a lawyer, represented him. But if not, he'd have to have a public defender. And this was part of the government's tactic. They said, well, freeze his accounts so that he has no money and can't defend himself and will have to have mediocre counsel. Um, certainly, the governments also can have legitimate freezing of accounts. For example, freezing Al-Qaeda accounts or freezing drug baron accounts. But it, you're really going to have to have a lot of faith in the judicial system and the criminal system to go ahead and believe that they're always going to use that power for good. Uh, for the most part, you cannot freeze a Bitcoin account. The government can say, turn your Bitcoins over or don't use them. Uh, somebody can destroy the computer that holds the address for the Bitcoin, rendering them unusable for everybody, not just you. For the most part, no one can interfere with your Bitcoins. If you own them, they're in your account, you must consent to not use them or to get rid of them. And the last thing is sending Bitcoins to somebody. Once you understand how to do it, which actually isn't that hard, is remarkably simple. It is so incredibly simple. It's basically like sending an email. You just enter an address, click a button, and bing, they've received their money. No bank has to be involved. No other party has to be involved. It would be as simple as you seeing me on the side of the street, walking up to me, opening your wallet, pulling out a $20 bill, and handing it to me. In fact, to further belabor the analogy, I am actually sitting in a dark room, you can't see anything, and you slide the $20 bill underneath the door. That is basically how a transaction works. You're just taking something that we know to be yours and handing it to somebody else, and then the entire Bitcoin network instantly knows, well, very quickly knows, within an hour, that you've done that. It's very cool. So who controls this? How is it controlled? It's very difficult for people in the financial industry, much less in, in the public as a whole, to kind of wrap their mind around a decentralized currency because the first question you always ask is, who's behind it? Who regulates it? Who's in control of it? For the most part, it's like asking who controls a torrent. 
there's the person who may upload the file to begin with, but once you have a torrent cloud and everybody's downloading the file, no one person controls that. It's a, it's a group of peers talking to each other. So in essence, as a peer-to-peer -peer system, the entire network has to agree on the rules beforehand, but once it's done, you can't undo it. So the Bitcoin is autonomous now. If all the people who created the Bitcoin, if Satoshi disappeared, the Bitcoin Open Source Alliance disappeared, but people were still running the software that was developed, the Bitcoin would continue to live. We could have one half of the entire world population die, and Asia and Africa become radioactive wastelands filled with flesh-eating zombies. And even in the event that that happened, this, this terrible radioactive zombie apocalypse land, if even two computers were running the Bitcoin software, they would be able to trade the Bitcoin between each other, and they would not need any additional help. It's a peer-to-peer -peer system. Therefore, no one entity controls it. No one ever can control the Bitcoin. It's not regulatable in a traditional sense, and it's not controllable in a traditional sense. It truly is just like the Internet, out of the hands of any one entity, nation, party, or person. So, of course, you'll be asking, why the hell is the Bitcoin worth anything? So let's go back to our money. Why is money worth something? Well, it's because people are agreeing to do stuff for you with Bitcoins, and people are also agreeing to give you things for Bitcoins. Believe it or not, there exist exchanges where you can trade Bitcoins for money, but also there exist places where you can sell, uh, you can exchange your Bitcoins for goods and services. So think about supply and demand, and think about what people are willing to exchange for in terms of goods and services. This is how you price a currency. So the reason why the US dollar is worth so much in comparison with third world nation currencies is that there is a tremendous demand relative to supply for the dollar. And most of the world is willing to exchange goods and services for the dollar. When you go to China, you will find many vendors who actually accept the US dollar as a currency. It's kind of amazing to be in a different nation and have the money of America still be used there because there's such a demand for it, and therefore the US dollar is worth a lot. In terms of the Bitcoin, every single year we have seen a dramatic increase in the amount of vendors willing to accept the Bitcoin for goods and services. Another reason why the Bitcoin is worth something is it's a pricing mechanism for two particular things. First off, it's a pricing mechanism for the fear of governments being involved with currency. That Zimbabwean $100 trillion bill is a terrifying prospect for some people, and that intrinsic fear that some people tend to have about governments and how they conduct their financial affairs is priced by the Bitcoin in some part. Also, the notion of anonymity, privacy on the internet, to be able to move money around that can't be frozen, to be able to be anonymous on the internet, protect yourself from inflation or outside manipulation. That is another mechanism, and the Bitcoin is actually pricing these things. So the non-affiliation with the government, the, the distributed nature, it's a resistance to manipulation and inflation, these kinds of things actually give the Bitcoin intrinsic value that adds to the value natural supply and demand and what people are willing to exchange for it in terms of goods and services do. Last thing is, as more people use the Bitcoin for goods and services, it's going to increase in value. When I invested in Bitcoins, Bitcoins were several dollars. And I was incredibly happy when I watched the Bitcoin go all the way up to $266. It was kind of an amazing thing. It was very surreal to see it achieve that kind of value. Now, is that value sustainable? Nobody really knows. Yet what we do know is as a deflationary currency that becomes more scarce over time, proportional to the amount of people who invest in it, and as more people use it for regular goods and services, and as things like Cyprus collapsing or Greece collapsing or uh, the US dollar losing value and people's concerns about privacy increase, the Bitcoin is going to increase in value. Uh, and that's why Bitcoins in a nutshell are worth something. And there's more reasons, but these in my mind are the most powerful, compelling reasons. There's a floor established by uh, a, a disassociation from governments and privacy. And then 
if it becomes a ubiquitous currency that everybody on the internet tends to use to buy things and trade things, it, the Bitcoin will become incredibly valuable. All right, well, that's all I have for you for lecture one. I've included a lot of links here that I, my mind are wonderful introductions to the Bitcoin. The first two links, we use coins.com and Bitcoin Me are introductory websites that have some great videos I'd really recommend to watch that kind of give you a, a sense of what the Bitcoin is about. It's similar to my video, I went into a lot more depth uh, and mine is cumulative, it's going to build into other concepts. These give you kind of a rough idea that you can share with people to give them a notion of why the Bitcoin is valuable. Uh, CoinLab uh, is a uh, another website. The Bitcoin Primer is a PDF uh, that's free to download and it kind of gives you a stronger notion of what the Bitcoin is about in a written format and it goes into a bit more depth. Uh, I've also included Bitcoin.it wiki and there's a wonderful FAQ that has tons of frequently asked questions about the Bitcoin as well as a bunch of links to help you kind of drill down. The official, if there ever is an official website for the Bitcoin is Bitcoin.org slash en and this website kind of tells you um, is an aggregation point to help you get the software you need to be able to use the Bitcoin um, and also connects you to many of the community resources. And the final thing I include is a interview of Kevin O'Leary, uh, who is a very wealthy man. If you've, you've ever watched the show Shark Tank, uh, he's one of the sharks on Shark Tank, and he's uh, he's also a billionaire, and he has a currency fund. And uh, they interviewed him, and he's talking about the Bitcoin, some of the challenges of the Bitcoin, and why the Bitcoin is valuable. So I would really highly recommend uh, going to all of these links on your time when you have the ability. Uh, the PDF is available, and the links are embedded within the PDF uh, and uh, you can always just of course enter them into your URL if you so choose but uh, in any event thank you for listening uh, and I'll I, I'll love to see you in lecture two have a wonderful day